Hello there, I'm Chris Stashu. And this is Father Malone. And I'm Mike White. And we are the hosts of Dreams for Sale, a monthly look at the Twilight Zone 1985. On this episode of Dreams for Sale, we're going to be looking at the sixth episode of Twilight Zone 1985. It is broken up into two parts, Examination Day, which is about 10 minutes long, and A Message from Charity, which clocks in just under 40 minutes. So uh, let's get started with a look at Examination Day. So Examination Day aired on November 1st, 1985. It's directed by Paul Lynch, written by Philip Daguerre, based on a short story by Henry Sleazar, stars David Mendenhall, Christopher Allport, and Elizabeth Normant. And the episode focuses around David Mendenhall, who plays a young boy who has to go in for a mandatory IQ test in the near future, far future, future nonetheless, I would say. Uh, In terms of things that we've watched for this show this was a pretty good 10 minute segment if anything for me it was a little stretched out at 10 minutes i think it could have actually been five yeah if that they could for me they could have put a title card up that said the smart people will die (laughs) right i mean like you have to kind of infer that at the end yeah yeah Yeah, i mean it's funny because i read the short story that this is based on and it's only three pages long i think and they tell him right up front that it is a IQ exam or an intelligence test that the government's going to give him. And then it's funny because his dad, after he tells him, yeah, they're going to test your intelligence, tells him to go read a comic book, which I thought was funny. It's like, that's going to dumb him down. And then at one point, <laughs> the kid is asking, like, well, you know, why is the grass green and his father's like nobody knows and then he asks how far the sun away the the sun is away from the earth and his father says 5000 miles and i'm like is he giving him wrong answers on purpose or has intelligence kind of been bred out of us by this point so that he is actually stupid and that's why he's still alive and his son is not stupid and that's why he's going to die So I think that had they stuck with giving us what the test is up front, that might have made it a little bit better. Yeah, I did uh, not like this uh, at all. Um, And this is one I actually do remember, uh, like, originally um, seeing it when it aired. But um, uh, then as now, it's uh, so telegraphed from the get-go that uh, – that either way, this kid is going to maybe not die, but um, just because it is the Twilight Zone and they traffic in twists, you know, you, one's mind starts to immediately put it together. I'm sure you guys did as well. And um, I don't know. I just didn't. I, I don't know. I didn't care for the episode or story. It reminded me a lot of Harrison Bergeron, but I like Harrison Bergeron so much more. Exactly. That's that's the other. I mean, that was that that came to mind while I was watching it. But that's you know brilliant. And then this is just sort of, hey, here's the twist. Yeah. Plus, I love I loved all the uh, the the plasma globes. It was so futuristic when they so, uh, when they go it was to the so testing 1990s center. So 1990s science museum. Yeah. Oh my god! In heaven. Yeah, that was a little much. When I saw those, I was like, oh god. Really? This is this is a little cheese ball. So I, I liked it, but I do agree that I think it could have been a lot shorter. And it is pretty goddamn telegraphed, like from the get go. And let me let me say something about David Mendenhall. He represents that sort of breed of child actor that was really sort of super popular in the eighties, but that just kind of drives me nuts. The sort of bright yeah. and precocious and makes me want to slap him immediately. Yeah. Not too much? Uh, he's, <laughs> no, no. I mean, as soon as I saw him, I was just like, oh, it's the over-the-top kid, and he's always over-the-top. That's right. Oh, my God. I didn't even recognize him from that movie. But, yes, that's true. He's uh, he's very earnest as a child oh. actor. What, whatever became of him? Does, did, I'm sure one of you did the research. He is still working. Uh, he, when he was a kid, he was doing tons of voice work, and he continued doing that. I didn't realize that. Sam Witwicky from the Transformers movies was based upon David Witwicky, and he was the voice of David Witwicky from the Transformers movie, which, ah. like I said, I had no idea. But yeah, he's still doing stuff. Um, not a whole lot. He'll just show up here and there. Uh, I kind of wish that he was, you know, had turn that uh, voice work into a career yeah i don't begrudge him having a career continuing but uh in this episode like i kind of was happy he you know met his fate (laughs) yeah 
<laughs> so, okay, so here, here's here's where my line of logic went, and I did not read the short story until after, so I didn't know what the twist was going to be, and obviously, having never seen this before, I mean, I knew there, there was going to be some kind of twist, especially with it being uh, kind of a 10-minute segment, and it was setting itself up, clearly setting itself up for a twist. I honestly thought it was going to be like Blade Runner, and it was going to be like the kid was a robot, and they were trying to figure out if they could tell if it was a robot kid or not, because he, the kid was so over the top. But oh, I, like, yeah. I like read in, I read into it the wrong direction. <laughs> like I completely read but, into it the wrong. Uh, but you're not wrong. That that kid is a robot, and uh, he needs to be eliminated. Well, <laughs> and he and and he is at the end. They're like, "What would you like for us to do with the body?" It's like, oh, fuck. <laughs> um, yeah, that is pretty. That's pretty heavy. I, yeah, it's I, pretty I'll give dark him that. Shit. I mean, it goes. It this episode goes for it, which I do appreciate because they imply that a child is essentially murdered <laughs> off screen. Oh yeah. <laughs> which I mean, yeah, you know. it's a pretty heavy implication. What do you want us to do? Do you want the you want us to inter him, or do you want to have a private service? But it did remind me a lot of Dreams for Sale. Um, that was yeah. I agree hundred percent with that. Yeah, and uh, it just reminded me how good Dreams for Sale was and how. Uh, uh, clumsy this one was. Yeah, it, it was definitely too long. Like I said, I liked it, but again, also never seen it before. Didn't read the source material until after. So when the twist came at the end, I was like, okay, sure, I'm on board. Like, this is pretty rough. Like, they're, it's like, oh, your kid's dead. Um, you know, when I kept thinking that during the episode, and I wish they had kind of addressed it in some way, and they could have done it very easily, was why aren't the parents just simply saying, do bad? You know what I mean? Like they, it just seems like they have the opportunity to say this is a test for your intelligence, and if you're too smart, then it's going to be bad for you. And like, had there just been some sort of like camera system in their home, like that they were constantly like looking at, like, well, we can't say anything because um, then they'll kill us as well. Um, that I, I don't know that that kind of bothered me too. Yeah, I mean, that's a fair point, because the parents are essentially, like, not doing enough to try to stop him from being murdered. Right. It's not so like they, they don't give know. Him the truth serum, which is nice, that had he tried to lie and be dumb on purpose. Yeah, I mean, the truth, serum, right. the truth serum thing feels like a little bit of a cop-out. Yeah. Yeah. Right? Like, they, you know, uh, I'm not sure if I was given a truth serum, I could answer some of the questions they were probably asking. Like, that's the oh, problem with, in my mind, a truth serum. is like a truth serum is like just prevents him from lying, but it doesn't prevent him from not knowing information. Right. That's true. The, the answer is 13, by the way. No, thank you. No problem. <laughs> Good to know. But, you know, again, look, here, here's the ultimate success of this of this segment. It's not a half an hour long. Yeah. <laughs> right? I mean, yeah, we have seen Couldn't agree with stuff, that more. Yeah, we've seen some stuff that's like, oh shit, I really am glad that this is not a half an hour long. And this is one of those things where it's like, I'm glad this is not a full 20, 30 minute segment. So it's, yeah, it feels too long for being 10 minutes, but at the same time, at least it's not 45 minutes. Which they easily could have stretched it out to. So yeah, good on them for sparing us. Well, and I would have been really uh, impressed if they stretched a three-page short story into a 37-minute segment on Twilight Zone. I I think it's been done before. Yeah, it sure has, hasn't it? So let's move on to the next segment, A Message from Charity. Harmon Brook is very different today. Its water is not quite as pure. Its banks lined with tracked homes and shopping centers. But Bear Rock is still there, and so is a message. A message from a girl long gone, and yet never really gone in heart and mind. A last remembrance of friendship and first love. A love that will live only and always in the Twilight Zone. So A Message from Charity was also directed by Paul Lynch. It's The teleplay is written by Alan Brennert. It's based on a short story by William M. Lee. It stars Carrie Noonan and Duncan McNeil. And it centers around Duncan McNeil, who is a teenage boy who has a fever, who somehow, through the water supply, discovers a telepathic connection with a girl who lived 300 years before him in colonial New England, who's played by Carrie Noonan. This is one of those segments that's definitely, uh, you know, 20 minutes too long. I can't disagree with you. Um, I mean, it was kind of an interesting idea, and they went some places, but again, man, did I see that uh, whole witchcraft thing coming. 
Oh yeah, like right from the get go, uh, that 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 was going to be um, the the sort of payoff. However, uh, I, I really enjoyed this episode. Um, I, I agree, it was probably stretched out a little too long. They should have just uh, maybe lopped ten minutes off of it here or there. Uh, they, I don't think that would have uh, harmed it in any way. But um, I really liked it, and uh, I liked that. Um, you know, obviously it was going to be the sort of Salem witch trial um, parable, but it didn't I, – I thought that the twist that it actually ends up being okay for everyone was very welcome. Um, I actually found myself quite nervous once the uh, like the sort of a witch finder general character shows up. I'm like, oh my god, really? We're going to have to watch this kid die? Um, so, uh, I don't know. Overall, I really liked it, and I liked the performances in it as well. And uh, I thought Alan Brennan's script was actually pretty good. Um, obviously, when you start dealing with language like mayhap and ye and air, uh, <laughs> like it can be a bit, a bit uh, trying for the ears. But uh, I still think uh, there was a consistency there that I appreciated. No, I think it's one of these segments that, like Mike said, it's a lot better in theory and in execution. It's uh, Look, you could have taken 10, 15 minutes out of this and put another segment in this episode. And I don't think that the story of A Message from Charity would have been any worse for the wear. And then the ending feels like it goes on for a minute too long and it oh it, it easily went on too long yeah yeah like it's it's way too for what it is it's way too long yeah what troubled me was that like they have this connection that they don't understand and they have no control over and then she's kind of just makes a decision like okay that's it i'm not gonna do this anymore like well you could have done that from the beginning then um and uh and probably would have been no worse for wear so uh and then well, i thought it was super weird to have the Twilight Zone narrator actually narrating and like uh, giving us <laughs> giving us plot points instead yeah. of just sort of wrapping it up. Yeah, that was really strange. I was like, did he just come in and tell us something and now he's not there anymore? Like I thought for sure he would say, you know, and their communication could only continue in the Twilight Zone or something like that. But no. No, just like, hey, they, you know, it's a little bit later now, everybody, and he's now a popular kid, and what's going to happen next? Let's find out. I was like, wait, what? And they very easily could have, like, just had, you know, that, uh, the the sort of connection, like, uh, uh, broken between them, and then him going to the rock and finding the carving. Like, that would have been absolutely acceptable. I don't think we needed to see another, like, two or three minutes of him, like, at school and longing for her. I was waiting for something more like Looper or something where when he's looking at the book that the history starts to change while he's actually looking at it or something like that where, you know, or like she now knows more about the future. So she becomes a bigger deal in the past. I was like, OK, yeah, this something like that should happen, but it doesn't. No, it didn't. I mean, look. Ultimately, I think it was an it was a gentle tale, well told. I I, I don't know. I mean, I, I don't disagree that it's too long, but um, I was pleasantly diverted for the uh, for for the run of it, and I enjoyed those two characters and uh, the, the the connection that they had. And I don't know. I liked it obviously a lot more than you two, but um, no, uh, I actually I, I, I don't do find fault with it other than being a little bit too long i mean the idea of whatever for whatever reason the idea of like puritanical times and stuff scares the hell out of me maybe it's because seeing like the haunting of cassie palmer when i was a kid and just the weird like <laughs> we know why because you're a fucking we, witch yeah exactly i mean and that was the most intense part for me was when the witch finder showed up and he was like yeah i'm gonna examine every part of you for that witch mark and she's calling him out for like well what about this girl that got examined for hours and hours and why was she crying i was like yeah, this is really skeezy stuff. But then, then it kind of, you know, like ends a little happy, and I was like, hmm, wow, we went to some dark places here. But yeah, no, I I didn't find it objectionable other than the length. Yeah, and that 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 sort of rapey scene, like in the middle of it, was like, wow, completely, like uh, completely I, not in tone with the rest of the episode. No, but then again, like you know, that sort of thing I'm sure occurred all the time with these uh the these mm -hmm. sort of magistrates in power like, "Oh yeah, we're going to go examine some witches now." Um so I mean, it, it, you know, it didn't feel uh, out of place. It just was kind of shocking. But that's I guess the point. 
Yeah, I mean, again, it's look, if we're talking about <laughs> segments in this show that we've seen so far, this is in the lower half, but it's in the upper quarter of the lower half. It's not terrible. <laughs> it tells an interesting story, <laughs> but like, I think the story is just pretty vanilla and not much it's just not much i think it's, it's just- a 75 percent of 20 percent yes thank you you get everything to the left of the chiclets but to the right of the <laughs> you, know what, you know what i have to say so to anything you. in this general area <laughs> you know what <laughs> fuck you guys all i'm saying is is it's okay not great it's not yeah but better than like some e-box. better than some we've seen yeah yeah it's not oh my god or e-box. that that little kid lost. Holy Jesus! Oh, or yeah. if she, or if she dies, at least at least a message from Charity tells a coherent, well thought out story. It's a little vanilla, but at least there's a a rising action and a falling action, and everything in between makes sense. Unlike some of the other ones we've seen, where it's just like we're just gonna throw everything at the screen and see what happens. Huh. And you know, uh, one thing that I, I really did like is when the uh, when the uh, witch finders uh, show up. That uh, James Cromwell's father's character is just like, no, I'm not letting you touch her. Get the hell out of here. And then, like, uh, has a full on fight with them, you know, uh, because that's part and parcel with the sort of like a witch tale where everyone turns on you. So that was uh, that was kind of uh, pleasant that uh, that was that he was defending her. And it was nice seeing James Cromwell in this. Yes. So young and unlined. Yeah. I mean, James Cromwell's great, though, in everything I've seen him in. So, you know, I was more surprised that he was in it, you know. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, as soon as he started to talk, I was like, Is that that's James Cromwell? Oh my god. Yeah. <laughs> it brings some gravitas to the episode. Yeah. And uh and he makes the dialogue seem natural, whereas sometimes it felt like uh Carrie Noonan was kind of stumbling with her things. It felt a little bit sometimes like she had re looped all of her dialogue. That was uh, uh that's uh, just a feeling I had while I was watching it. What I liked about the episode the most is when the kid is eating food so that she can taste it. Yeah, that was that was pretty unusual. I liked that. That was a really yeah. interesting stylistic choice. Like that's a weird thing to like focus on. Like, oh, you you think that that tastes good? Ooh, <laughs> you ain't seen nothing yet. I'm gonna gain thirty pounds and show you a good time. Yeah, I'm gonna eat all this chocolate ice cream. Yeah, they did that slow pan across all of the junk food. I'm like, how is this kid still eating at this point? Like, shouldn't he be just doubled over, <laughs> barfing his brains out? <laughs> she happened to uh, connect with Joey Chestnut, and he ate fifty hot dogs for her. <laughs> <laughs> But again, I think ultimately, like if we're talking about you know this episode with these two segments, this is the stronger of the two. Right? Oh, I- yeah. I mean, if we want to complain about the length, like uh, um, uh, I would have taken you know uh, ten minutes more over uh, the, the the examination day. Uh, I, I don't know. I, I liked these characters. I, I was sort of enjoying their tale. So, well, if, if um, the option is give examination day ten more minutes or leave this one the length that it is, yeah, yes. Yeah, I agree. Do not give Examination Day any more time because I think it no. does doesn't do enough with the time that it's given to begin with. Yeah, I mean, it, going, doubling back on Examination Day, could that not have just been a five minute segment where it's the kid in the room taking the test and then oh nope, you did too well. Sorry, come with us. Didn't need to meet his parents at all. I mean, have we had a segment that's shorter than ten minutes? Isn't ten minutes like the shortest that they go? Uh, yeah, I think so. Like, how long was uh, Children's Zoo? Probably around the same length. Yeah. Yeah, it seems about right. I mean, I can't imagine that they would go any shorter than 10 minutes. Like, I, d- I don't know how you tell a coherent, like, story in-, in five minutes. Well, there's probably a minimum between commercial breaks, too. Exactly. Right. But, yeah, this is definitely, like, w- you know, last couple episodes we've seen, uh, you know, episode four and episode five were not great and this one it seems to be going back in the right direction a little bit yes but i think uh i think our, our next episode will include a, a kind of a ponderous one well alan smithy directed one of the segments for the next <laughs> i episode. was about to say doesn't that always just give off the reek of quality when is someone that, refuses to put their name on it isn't that the is it the paladin of the lost hour episode yep uh yes it is no oh. okay there you With go danny fucking k yeah yeah I yeah. thought you were going to go for Danny Bonaduce. <laughs> Danny Bonaduce? No. Um, marked improvement over some of the scene, the ones we've uh, we've already seen. Um, I mean, I would recommend this one. Ye gods. Yeah. Mm-hmm. At least the characters in this one have a name. <laughs> That's true. <laughs> yeah. Instead of the girl. Yeah. Right. Interesting stylistic choice there. 
the girl. No, I just want to double back on Examination Day one more time because um, – when they showed the sort of opening uh, establishing shot, the sort of, uh, you know, horrible matte painting of the future that just looked like it was recycled from Buck Rogers, I was like, oh, my God, it's going to be one of these. But then uh, the, the sort of next day, the day of the examination, when, uh, when, it's, uh, when it's storming outside, they, they showed the same thing again with the storm. And I actually thought it looked great. Um, I just want to throw a little praise on that for that. I, I just thought that looked really good. Apropos of nothing, guys. I mean, it looked better than, like you said, the first time they showed it. Yeah, um, I mean, which just looked like, ugh. The thing, the thing that does disappoint me a little bit is that Alan Brenner, this is his second episode that he's written. And it is definitely not as good as his first one. And I don't think anything will live up to his first one that he's written for the show that we've seen so far. Because um, he wrote Shatterday, the teleplay. So and Philip Daguerre right. wrote Night... Well, and Philip Daguerre did Nightcrawlers, so... Yeah, um, I think of the two... I think Alan Brennert has a better track record then. Yes, I would agree. <laughs> mm-hmm. I would agree, because Nightcrawlers is... Nightcrawlers is not as good as Examination Day, but again, that's because Examination Day is only 10 minutes long. Yeah. So should Nightcrawlers have been 10 minutes long? No, because then they would have given more time to Little Boy Lost. <laughs> oh, okay. All right. Or, Jesus. To, or, or another There's 10 minutes. So many ratios back. to work out here. Yeah. Well, that's yeah. the one thing about this show that is... That's the one thing about this show that is a little weird is it's broken up into like two or three segments as opposed to with the original show one so right but yeah. i think i think that's a benefit ultimately sure because, yeah you know yeah i mean i, but it puts I us like in this i like situation. the variety of the uh, the lengths but it puts us yeah in i mean weird situation where we're like well this could have gotten more time this should have maybe had less time true but that's probably good i mean yeah. i don't know uh it, it, it allows for a more interesting discussion where you can sort of point quickly to uh, to that and uh, know that, like, uh, well, the the idea wasn't total garbage. It was a good twist. But Jesus Christ, why are you doing it for 40 minutes? Yeah, no, exactly. Um, anything else? I liked it. Watch this episode, even with <laughs> Examination Day. Even with you not liking Examination Day, watch it. Yeah, I mean, you know what? Maybe somebody wouldn't have any idea what was about to happen in Examination Day, and it could uh, twist their mind a little bit. So, yeah, mm. I mean, it's not a it's not a poor idea for a dystopian future that they're killing all the smart people. But, um, I don't know, it was just handled kind of poorly, and that kid, oh boy, that kid. <laughs> I really don't like the kid. Oh, no, no, not at all. Yeah. So on the next episode of Dreams for Sale, we're going to be talking about, like we mentioned already, episode seven, Teacher's Aid and Paladin of the Lost Hour. Paladin of the Lost Hour is the one that we were mentioning that was uh, directed by Gilbert Cates, but credit is Alan Smithy. So buckle up. That one has the potential to be the worst thing we've watched so far. I would assume. It's yeah, I think his name is. I think garbage. overall it's going to be because Teacher's Aid is also garbage. <laughs> oh, great! Exciting. Um. So, uh, until so look forward then, to that episode. <laughs> yeah. Uh, until then, where can people find you, Father Malone? Uh, you can find me on my YouTube channel, Lot 5 Films. i got a show called You've Never Seen. Uh, you can also hear me uh, twice a month talking about Tales from the Crypt on Chronicles from the Crypt. Uh, that is a podcast I co-host with you, Chris. It's true. It's true. It's damn true. What about you, Mike White? Where can people find you? Well, when uh, you're not hearing me here, you can also hear me with my Chris Dashu podcast, which is Kolchak Tapes, where we talk about the Night Stalker, Carl Kolchak, available at kolchaktapes.com. And you can also hear me over at The Projection Booth, which is available at projectionboothpodcast.com. And you can hear me on my Chris Dashu podcast over at culturecast.com, where I talk about movies. Yes, not TV, because that's like everything else that I talk about pretty much. So uh, yeah, culturecast.com. If you want to check out more Twilight Zone 1985 Dreams for Sale episodes, head on over to twilightzone85.com where you can find out, uh, you can find the rest of the episodes for the show. Big thanks as always to Roxy Drive and Neutron Dreams for the intro outro music. <laughs>